This is a sermon from Cornerstone Church in Kingston. We're delighted to make these resources available for you and hope that you enjoy the ministry of God's Word today. There are lots of other resources on our website which we are pleased to make available and you can browse our website and download sermons and podcasts, read blogs and articles. And if you've been listening for a while and you would like to get to know the church or for us to get to know you a bit, there is an e-contact card, a welcome card that you can fill in on our website and we'd love to hear from you. And if you would like to take your Bibles and uh, turn to Judges chapter 2, our reading is going to be verse 6 of chapter 2 to chapter 3 verse 11. Judges chapter 2 verse 6. After Joshua had dismissed the Israelites, they went to take possession of the land, each to their own inheritance. The people served the Lord throughout the lifetime of Joshua and of the elders who outlived him and who had seen all the great things the Lord had done for Israel. Joshua, son of Nun, the servant of the Lord, died at the age of 110, and they buried him in the land of his inheritance at Timnath, Heres in the hill country of Ephraim, north of Mount Gash. After that whole generation had been gathered to their ancestors, another generation grew up who knew neither the Lord nor what he had done for Israel. Then the Israelites did evil in the eyes of the Lord and served the Baals. They forsook the Lord, the God of their ancestors, who had brought them up out of Egypt They followed and worshipped various gods of the peoples around them. They aroused the Lord's anger because they forsook him and served Baal and the Ashtoreths. In his anger against Israel, the Lord gave them into the hands of raiders who plundered them. He sold them into the hands of their enemies all around, who they were no longer able to resist. Whenever Israel went out to fight, the hand of the Lord was against them to defeat them just as he had sworn to them. They were in great distress. Then the Lord raised up judges who saved them out of the hands of these raiders. Yet they would not listen to their judges, but prostituted themselves to other gods and worshipped them. They quickly turned from the ways of their ancestors who had been obedient to the Lord's commands. Whenever the Lord raised up a judge for them, he was the judge and saved them out of the hands of their enemies. As long as the judge lived, for the Lord relented because of their groaning under those who oppressed and afflicted them. But when the judge died, the people returned to the ways even more corrupt than of those ancestors, following other gods and serving and worshipping them. They refused to give up their evil ways and stubborn ways. Therefore, the Lord was very angry with Israel and said, because this nation has violated the covenant I ordained for their ancestors, And has not listened to me, I will no longer drive out before them any of the nations Joshua left when he died. I will use them to test Israel and see whether they will keep the way of the Lord and walk in it as their ancestors did. The Lord has allowed those nations to remain. He did not drive them out at once by giving them into the hands of Joshua. These are the nations the Lord left to test all those Israelites who had not experienced any of the wars in Canaan. He did this only to teach warfare to the descendants of the Israelites, who had not had previous battle experience. The five rulers of the Philistines, all the Canaanites, the Sidonians and the Hivites, living in the, La- living in the Lebanon mountains, from Mount Baal Hermon to Lebo Hamath. They were left to test the Israelites, to see what they would obey the Lord's commands which he had given them and their ancestors through Moses. The Israelites lived among the Canaanites, Hittites, Amorites, Perizzites, Hivites, and Jebusites. They took their daughters in marriage and gave their own daughters to their sons and served their gods. The Israelites did evil in the eyes of the Lord. They forgot the Lord their God and served the Baals and the Ashtoreths. The anger of the Lord burned against Israel so that he sold them into the hands of of Cushan Rishaphaim, king of Aram, Naharim, to whom the Israelites were subject for eight years. But when they cried out to the Lord, he raised up for them a deliverer, Othniel, son of Kenaz, 
Caleb's younger brother, who saved them. The Spirit of the Lord came on him so that he became Israel's judge and went to war. The Lord gave Cushan Rephaim, king of Aram, into the hands of Ophniel, who overpowered him. So the land had peace for 40 years until Othniel, son of Kenaz, died. Well, thanks, Dean. Uh, evening from me. My name's uh, Rory. Uh, I'm one of the members of staff here. Uh, and may I add my, my welcome to you all. Um, I feel like I have to say something about Media Fast now because I've been rebuked from the front. Uh, I had a great time in Media Fast. Uh, I loved just spending time with the church family. Uh, and I loved reading through this book of Judges because I love this book. Um, and now you think, well, how can you say that? It's the most depressing book in the world. And that's kind of why I love it, actually. Um, it is a superb book. And the reason why it's superb is because it really shows us who God is. And in the light of who God is, it reveals to us what we're like. And I think that's really important. One, of the, um, one, of, uh, one commentator said this, the book of Judges is about faithless people and a faithful God. The story of the Israelites in the period of the Judges is our story too. So it's not just a story. If you were here last week when Pete was preaching in the morning, he says that the, the headlines of Judges are similar to the headlines of today. It's our world. We are God's people if we're in the church. And we need to respond accordingly as we read Judges. So that's what we need God's help with tonight. Let's pray as we begin. Father, uh, we thank you so much um, for this book. And yes, it is dark and it is gloomy in places. Um, but we, we thank you that we need that to show us the glory of you and show, you, show us the glory of our great deliverer, the Lord Jesus Christ. So we pray, Father, that tonight, as we consider um, this chap, these chapters, that you will help us, help us to see your graciousness, help us to see our, our wickedness, and help us to see the glory of the Lord Jesus Christ. We pray these things in his name. Amen. Now, often, uh, the, it's often the case uh, that when you have a really good generation or, or a generation that's good at something, you question what will the next generation be like. So if you have a, a great warfaring nation, you might think, well, what is the next generation going to be like? Or if you have a great sporting nation, you know, like the South Africans are very good at rugby, will the next uh, generation of South Africans be good at rugby? Yeah. Sorry, I just saw South Africans and I thought I'd have a pop at them. Uh, uh, or, or, or the next Brazilian football team, will the next ones be great? Or uh, they're, they're, they're very good at one thing. Will the next generation be good? That's often the case. And I actually think that's what we see in the beginning of the passage that we looked at today. You'll notice that Joshua is alive again. Judges is a weird book. It's got two introductions. Seems unnecessary. It's not unnecessary. The first one is kind of from Israel's perspective. The second one is God's perspective. And Joshua is alive again. It's weird. Joshua dies three times in three chapters. It's devastating for the man. <laughs> but we get Joshua again in verse 6 to 9. And you'll notice that when Joshua is there, when Joshua is leading the people of God, he is a fantastic leader. The people served the Lord throughout the lifetime of Joshua, verse 7, and of the elders who outlived him and who had seen all the great things the Lord had done for Israel. They were brilliant. They were, they, they, they were maybe the golden generation of serving God under Joshua. And, uh, and they do find it hard. They do struggle. And as we see them, as they serve the Lord, you could ask the question, what will the next generation be like? Will they supersede them? Will they emulate them? Or will they fail trying? And uh, if you've read, read any of the judges, you'll, you'll know that the answer is a resounding, they will not emulate, they will not come anywhere close, they will fall far short of the standard that we see in verse 7. And so that's what I think we see. And, and we did do a little bit of this, but I'm going to go through this again. We're going to see, firstly, the cycle of sin and salvation. That's my first point. The cycle of sin and salvation. And uh, I've got a little rhyme for this. I think it's a rhyme. Well, it's a kind of, they all sound the same, these words. I did this for our rooted guys so they would remember it. And I actually can do some actions as well if you want to teach a kid. Do you want me to do some actions? Emma's nodding. Okay. They're really good, all right? So the cycle of sin and salvation from verse 6 to 19. 
And the first stage of the cycle is the people strayed. So they're straying. I've made a slideshow, strayed. Yeah, they strayed. Or you might want to use the word disobeyed. Or you might want to use the word betrayed. Or you might want to use all three. They strayed. And you can, here's a little, little, they strayed. They go away from God. Look with me at verse 10 to 12. After that whole generation had been gathered to their ancestors, another generation grew up who knew neither the Lord nor what he had done for Israel. Then the Israelites did evil in the eyes of the Lord and served the Baals. They forsook the Lord, the God of their ancestors who had brought them out of Egypt. They followed and worshipped various gods of peoples around them. They aroused the Lord's anger because they forsook him and served Baal and the Ashtoreths. So they're straying away. Did you notice the word forsook? They forsook the Lord. The one that had loved them, the one that that we know rescued the people of God from Egypt and had taken them through the wilderness and into the promised land that he had promised for them. And they know, they know that's what he's done for the generations before. And they say, we don't want any part in him. We're going to go away and we're going to serve our other gods. But the picture gets darker. If you look at verse 17, it's not just that they walk out on God, but the picture You must understand what this does to God. Look at verse 17. Yet they would not listen to their judges, but prostituted themselves to other gods and worshipped them. That is the picture of sin to God. One of prostitution. That is why sin is so horrible. That is why sin is so offensive to God. Because sin is adultery to God. See, see, God doesn't just want a people that are his citizens who obey him. God doesn't just want some people that are loyal to him in that sense. No, the picture in the Bible is that God is married to his people. Israel are meant to be God's beloved bride. And he's gone into a covenant, a married covenant with them where he promises to be faithful to them. And he wants them to be faithful to him and to him alone. He is exclusively their God. And so when they decide to forsake God, it's as if they're cheating on God. That is the picture of sin that we get in the Bible. If you read Hosea 1 to 3 or Ezekiel 16, you might want to do that in your own time. God paints the picture that your sin, that my sin, is a form of prostitution. I'm faithless. I walk out on God and and I go off with another God. And, and, And did you notice, though, it's not just one God. It's gods. It's Baals and Ashtoreths. The word Baal means lords. So you have many lords, you have lots of different gods. It's not just that I'm, I'm, I'm cheating with one god, I'm actually cheating with a, a whole host of gods. I'll, I'll just prostitute myself out to any god and any god, and I will seek pleasure from anyone without getting any, and I will seek love anywhere else without getting any. And God is there, the faithful one who's always loved and has always kept his end of the bargain and has never done anything to cheat on us, yet we walk out on him. And so the people of God go for these little mini gods, a God of fertility, a God of sex, a God of agriculture, a God of, a God of, and all these different little idols that they would have. And you might be here thinking, well, that's weird. They had these little gods. We don't have our little gods, except we do, don't we? We might not have a little statue that we take out and we touch and we always have to press and always have to answer and always have to check and always have to make sure that, you know, oh, my anxiety is, I need need to have the approval. We don't have that, do we? As one young person I heard say, I love my TV. (laughs) But actually, we have all sorts of idols. The idol of technology, as we've seen. The idol of my work, I must, I must... 
worship my work, the idol of family, the idol of leisure, the idol of me first above all others. Idols everywhere. The, the great reformer John Calvin said that our hearts are factory making, idol factories. Idol factories. They are in the production line. Idol, 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 idol. Something that I can cheat on God with. Something I can cheat on God with. Something I can replace the God of the Bible with. Something I can replace the God of the Bible with. See, it's not just that they, they leave God. In fact, they, 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 they probably said, I've got a place for God, but I've got a place for all these other gods. And so you can come week in and week out and sit in this church. And maybe that makes you feel good that you've given God of the Bible a little bit of time. Then you can go out and not give him any more thought and only care about the idols of your life. And that's what the people of God do here. And the problem now is that they have ceased to live out their purpose as Israel. See, Israel was meant to worship the Lord and the Lord alone. You shall have no other gods exclusively me, says God. And as you live for me, my chosen people, you are to be a missional people. That's what Israel meant to do. They get a whole law. They get a whole law that is meant to show that they are completely different to the nations around them. And when, they, when people are meant to see them, they go, wow, their God is different. Their God is worth worshiping. Yet they're not doing that. They've gone the other way. They've said, actually, I'm not going to stand out and be different as God wants me to be. I'm going to be exactly the same as all the other nations around them. And so they stray away from God. And what is God's response? Well, second part of the cycle, enslaved. I know it's, it's not technically a rhyme, is it? But it doesn't have a V. Oh, I, can't look, I can already see my mother-in-law yeah, judging me because she, she likes English. Grow up, okay? Enslaved. Enslaved. There you go. There's a nice and easy one for you. Enslaved. They're enslaved. See, God is a jealous God. God is not an uncaring God. God is not a God who can accept that his prized and precious loved one walks out on him. He is a jealous God. And so he burns hot with anger, did you see? In verse 14 to 15, in verse, sorry, 12, they arouse the Lord's anger. In verse 14, in his anger against Israel, the Lord gave them into the hands of the raiders who plundered them. He sold them into the hands of their enemies all around whom they were no longer able to resist. Whenever Israel went out to fight, the hand of the Lord was against them to defeat them, just as he had sworn to them. God, in his anger, gives them over to their idolatry. It's interesting that the very gods that they serve, the people that, the, that those gods belong to, end up enslaving them. And God says in his anger, I will give you over to your, your, your idolatry. Reminds me of Romans chapter 1, where the apostle Paul says, the wrath of God has been revealed against all the wickedness and ungodliness of men. And why is his, wickedness, why is his wrath being revealed? Because people have exchanged God's for things that have been created. In three times in Romans chapter one, he says, with exchange, they exchange, they exchange. And then it says, God gave them over. That's what idolatry does. It ends up enslaving people. Idolatry promises freedom and salvation, but all it results in is chains and damnation. It's like the, the drug addict. If that's not a great picture of, a, of an idol, then I don't know what is. There he is, and they, they, they go after the hit. They go after the hit. They go after the satisfaction. They go after the, the salvation that they think it can offer them, the escapism that it can offer them. Yet the more they take it, the more they need it. The more they take it, the more they need it. The more they take it, the more they need it. That's what idolatry does. It enslaves you. You can't get off it. You can't stop thinking about it. I love those, those pictures. I don't know if you've ever seen them. It's like a, it's got a phone and, it, and it, it's got a chain around someone. 
because everyone thinks, oh, this phone, I, I'm the boss of this phone, but it ends up the phone's in boss of you or money and it's changed you. That's, what's, that's what idolatry does. It enslaves us. It puts us in chains. And so what will the people do? Well, thirdly, they're dismayed. Here's a little sign for a picture for you. Dismayed. Got it? Dismayed. Why? Because they cry out to the Lord. Verse 15, they were in great distress. Verse 18, it says, uh, for the Lord relented. Why? Because of the groaning under those who oppressed and afflicted them. And time and time again, throughout the book of the Judges, you will see the phrase, the people cried out to the Lord. They cry out. And, and the question comes, is it genuine groaning? Is it genuine repentance? Because we've already seen last week in chapter 2 and verse 6, it says uh, in verse five, uh, four, 4, sorry, the people wept aloud and they called that place Bochum. There they offered sacrifices to the Lord. And you have to ask the question, is this genuine repentance? We've all been children. We've all done that thing where we said sorry, just to hopefully that the punishment won't be as bad. Is that what's going on here? Or is it genuine? They cry out to the Lord in their distress. And so, fourth part, judge raised, people saved. That's, we're celebrating, okay? Judge raised, people saved. Judge raised, people saved. And look how God responds in his absolute grace. They don't deserve this. No, you don't earn salvation like by our, our currency, by groaning, do you? It's not like, oh, well, good, they groaned. They don't deserve this. This is absolutely the grace of God. And so in verse uh, 16, what does it say? Then the Lord raised up judges who saved them out of the hands of the raiders. And then in verse 18, whenever the Lord raised up a judge for them, he was with the judge and saved them out of the hands of their enemies as long as the judge lived. And so he saves his people. And the people have a choice. The people always have a choice. Will I listen to the judge that God raised up? Will I obey the judge, God's judge, who brings me the word of God, who brings me salvation? Or will I trust and follow and serve and listen to the idols of the nations around them? And so what will happen next? Will they now, now they've been saved, will they now live for God? For God. Well, the fifth part, which is the first part, is the cycle starts over again. Look at verse 19. But when the judge died, the people returned to ways even more corrupt than those of their ancestors, following their gods and <laughs> serving and worshipping them. They refused to give up their evil practices and stubborn ways. It's a pretty, pretty dark picture, isn't it? Not only do they repeat, they get worse. And if, if you read Judges this week, you'll know that it doesn't get better. By the end of Judges, no one was laughing then, were they? So it's not just a cycle, it's actually a downward spiral. We should call it the spiral of sin and salvation. That is, this, that is the world that the people of God faced then, and that is the world that we face today. And so how will God respond now? Well, here's my second point. It's a very short one. The judgment of Jehovah. The judgment of Jehovah, testing and teaching. Look with me at verse 20 to 3.6. Therefore, the Lord was very angry with Israel and said, because this nation has violated the covenant I ordained for their ancestors and has not listened to me, I will no longer drive um, out before them any of the nations Joshua left when he died. I will use them to test Israel and see whether they will keep the way of the Lord and walk in it as their ancestors did. The Lord had allowed those nations to remain. He did not drive them out at once by giving them into the hands of Joshua. These are the nations the Lord left to test all those Israelites who had not experienced any of the wars in Canaan. He did this only to teach warfare to the descendants of the Israelites who had not had previous battle experience. 
The five rulers of the Philistines, all the Canaanites, the Sidonians, and the Hivites, living in the Lebanon mountains, from Mount Baal, Hermon, to Lebo, Hamath, they would, were left to test the Israelites to see whether they would obey the Lord's commands, which he had given their ancestors through Moses. You'll see verse 20, they violated the covenant. Violated it. And so God, in his judgment, says, fine, I won't drive the nations out. Fine, there they are for you. But amazingly, in God's sovereignty, he will use them to test them and to teach them. You'll see that word test came up three times and the word teach them. What is he testing them? He's testing whether they're going to be faithful. He's testing whether their repentance is genuine or not. He's testing them and teaching them warfare. And the question is, will they pass the exam? When we're getting tested, it's an exam. Will they pass the exam? Will they actually have genuine faithfulness? Will you, when the test comes to you, when you get confronted with the idol, will you pass the exam of faithfulness? Will you show genuine repentance? Will you go to war with your sin? Will they go to war with the nations around them? Will they? No. Look at verse 5 to 6. The Israelites lived among the Canaanites, Hittites, Amorites, Perizzites, Hivites, and Jebusites. They took their daughters in marriage and gave their own daughters to their sons and served their gods. They disobey in every way and at every chance that they can. They're found wanting in the test. It's a pretty damning indictment, isn't it? <laughs> they serve their gods. They, they don't care about God's words. And so the, the overview, the summary here of the whole of the book of Judges shows us a very bleak picture, doesn't it? It's a bleak picture. It's a dark picture. And so now we need to go from the the overview, the summary, the timeline as it was of, of judges, and we zoom in into our first judge. And here's my third point. The force of the faithful. You think that's weird? It's because I wanted it all to be... Same letters, sorry. The force of the faithful. Read with me verse 7 to 11. The Israelites did evil in the eyes of the Lord. They forgot the Lord their God and served the Baals and the Asherahs. The anger of the Lord burned against Israel so that he sold them into the hands of Cushan Rishathaim, king of Aram Naharaim, to whom the Israelites were subject for eight years. But when they cried out to the Lord, he raised up them a deliverer, Othniel, son of Kenaz, Caleb's younger brother, who saved them. The spirit of the Lord came on him so that he became Israel's judge and went to war. The Lord gave Cushan Rishathaim, king of Aram, into the hands of Othniel, who overpowered him. So the land had peace for 40 years until Othniel, son of Kenaz, died. Do you see the cycle playing out? First part, strayed, verse 7. The Israelites did evil in the eyes of the Lord. They forgot the Lord their God and served the Baals and Asherahs. There they go again, as always, going to their little gods, serving their little gods, prostituting themselves out to their gods. And they're wicked in the eyes of the Lord. They stray. But secondly, they're enslaved. Verse 8, the anger of the Lord burned against Israel. So he sold them into the hands of Cushan Rishathaim. Now, I don't think you want to name your kid Cushion Rishathaim. Not just the fact that it's quite a mouthful to say, but because of what it means. Unless you hate your kid, then maybe go for it. Cushion Rishathaim means dark or double wickedness. Might not be his real name, but that's certainly what they're calling him. Dark, double wickedness. Can you imagine that? Come here, dark, double wickedness. Wash your hands with tea. But it's showing us something that 
They do evil. They, they're wicked in the eyes of the Lord. And so he gives them over to darkness. He gives them over to double wickedness. And how long are they in this oppression for? Well, it's eight years of this oppression. It's eight years before the, the next stage. Eight years of this. They can last eight years of this absolute uh, oppressive Double wickedness over them. And finally, eight years later, our third part, dismay. They cry out to the Lord. But after eight years, finally, they go, this is rubbish. <laughs> cry out to the Lord. What are we thinking? Let's cry out to the one who can actually save us from this wickedness, from this idolatry that has enslaved us. And so what does God do? Because he is a merciful and a gracious and a loving God. What does he do every time? Verse 9, when they cry out to the Lord, he raised up for them a deliverer, Othniel, son of Kenaz, Caleb's younger brother who saved them. Now, who is this deliverer? Well, it's Othniel. Now, it's funny because when you, say, when you talk to people and you go, well, I'm actually looking at Othniel today, they're usually like, who's he? Isn't it? It's funny that they know, they could tell me about Samson, they could tell me about Gideon. They like the bad boys. But Othniel's not a bad boy. Othniel is one of the good ones. Actually, I think Othniel is as good as it gets. Which is quite, as we said, depressing. Is this, if this is the best thing that we get, what is coming? What does it mean? Othniel, the name means the force of God. What a name that is. If you want to call your kid something, Othniel. Not Cushion Rishathaim. Othniel, the force of God. And we can see straight away that this man is of good stock. We've seen him already, actually. Number one, he's related to Caleb. Now, Caleb is one of the legends of the Bible. Caleb's the one who says, we should go into the promised land and take it because we've got God. He's always faithful to the Lord. You can read Caleb's story. When, he, when he's 85, Caleb's still like, I'm strong as, uh, as ever. I'm going to go in and fight again. He's there driving out nations like, come on, lads, we're going to take this promised land. He's a good lad, Caleb. And so Othniel is related to him. In fact, Othniel is his nephew, I think, and married to his daughter. And the reason why he's married to his daughter is if you flick back to chapter 1 and verse 12 to 15, we get Othniel there. And Caleb said... I will give my daughter Aksa in marriage to the man who attacks and captures Kiriath Sefer. Othniel, son of Kenaz, Caleb's younger brother, took it. So Caleb gave his daughter Aksa to him in marriage. And then they, they asked for a, a bit of land there. So he's a proven seasoned warrior. He's one of the old God. He's one of the faithfuls that lived during Caleb's time. He's one that has got experience in going to battle. And he's probably now retired, a retired colonel, older in age. But remember, Caleb's his uncle. Caleb went to battle at 85. Othniel's going to battle at 85. And so he goes to war. It's interesting as well. You'll notice that unlike so many of the other judges, Othniel has no character flaws. Nothing bad said about Othniel. And so in verse 10, the spirit of the Lord comes upon Othniel. And firstly, he becomes Israel's judge. And I was reading um, a commentator called Matthew Henry, and he suggested that actually he starts to lead uh, a, a re reformation. He starts to lead people back to living for God. And after he does that, what does he do with the spirit of the Lord upon him? He goes to war. That's what the Israelites are meant to do. Do you remember that? God leaves all those nations there to teach them warfare, which hardly any of them do. But Othniel does. Othniel's going to go to war with the enemies of God. Othniel's going to go to war with Cush and Rishathaim. He's going to go to war with the dark, dark one. He's going to go to war with double wickedness himself. And so he does. And we get in verse, end of verse 10. The Lord gave Cush and Rishathaim, king of Aram, into the hands of Othniel, who overpowered him. Now, it's a bit of an ambiguous sentence, that, because who's overpowered him? Is it the Lord or is it Othniel? And I think the point of this is it's meant to be ambiguous because it's by his deliverer that God 
saves his people. And so Othniel goes in and he smashes double wickedness. He prevails over him. He overpowers him. And the result, verse 11, so the land had peace for 40 years until Othniel, son of Kenaz, died. Peace for 40 years. And then an ominous until. Until. Until Othniel died. And so the question may come, well, now will they carry on living as Othniel taught them? But the very next verse, verse 12, again, the Israelites did evil in the eyes of the Lord. <laughs> and they're right back at it. Do you know what they're like? Well, us, but the teachers walked out the room. Finally, let's get to the e- evil. <laughs> Sorry, <laughs> feels a bit harsh. The parent walks out, oh, finally, get that console on. I know we're not meant to be playing it, but she's gone now. The boss walks out, finally, we can just slack off a little bit here. The judge walks out, he dies, and they go right back to their evil ways. And so as good as Othniel is, we're still longing for another, aren't we? I mean, he's great. I love Othniel. He's the best. But he's not good enough. (laughs) Because as soon as he dies, the people go right back to it. We're longing for one who can bring peace. We're We're longing for the one who in Isaiah chapter 9 says there is a son who is to come and he will be called the prince of peace and of the greatness of his government and peace, there will be no end. We're longing for that one who can bring everlasting peace. And and with that promise of one who will be the prince of peace, the Lord Jesus Christ walks onto the stage and in and, 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 and is baptized and the spirit of God rests upon him and says, this is my son whom I am well pleased with. This is the one who comes and he goes to his hometown, Nazareth, and he goes into the temple, gets a scroll. And what does he say? Verse 18 of four, the spirit of the Lord is on me because he has anointed me to proclaim good news to the poor. What was he coming to do? He came, he was sent to proclaim freedom for the prisoners and recovery of sight for the blind to set the oppressed free to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor. This is the one who can set us properly free from our our sin and our addictions and our idolatry. This is the one who the spirit leads into battle in this world. He goes into the wilderness and succeeds where all others have failed before him. This is the one who goes into battle time and time again with sin, who has no character flaws. There was no deceit found in his mouth. This is the one who marches to the cross and goes to war. With darkness. Darkness is defeated on that cross. He goes to war with double wickedness. He goes to war with the king of double wickedness. Satan is defeated on that cross. That is our king. He is the warrior. He's the warrior king. Have you heard him? Have you seen him? Revelation. What a picture. This is team. Revelation 19, verse 11 to 16. I saw heaven standing open, and there before me was a white horse whose rider is called Faithful and True. Here he is, our warrior king. With justice he judges and wages war. His eyes are like blazing fire and on his head are many crowns. He has a name written on him that no one knows but he himself. He is dressed in a robe dipped in blood and his name is the word of God. The armies of heaven were following him riding on white horses and dressed in fine linen white and clean. Coming out of his mouth is a sharp sword with which to strike down the nations. He will rule them with an iron scepter. He treads the winepress of the fury of the wrath of God Almighty on his robe and on his thigh. He has this name written, King of Kings and Lord of Lords. That's our king. That's our warrior king. That's our warrior who goes to a cross and puts to death darkness and double wickedness but he will never die it's a peace eternal in revelation 1 verse 17 to 19 he says this 
Do not be afraid. I am the first and the last. I am the living one. I was dead. And now look, I am alive forever and ever. And I hold the keys of death and Hades. See, not only does he put to death sin and idolatry, and he doesn't, not only does he defeat Satan, but he does that for an eternity. He brings rest and he brings peace for all who will trust in him. That's our king. That's the warrior king that we long for when we see that Othniel dies. And so, where are you in all of this? Maybe you're here tonight and you've recognized that this downward spiral is one that is true of your life. Maybe you're someone here who longs for peace and for rest. Maybe you're one here who recognizes the idolatry that so clearly enslaves them. Well, can I show you again that Christ can defeat all of those things and Christ has defeated all of those things. And if only you will come and you will trust and you will listen and you will serve and you will follow this king, you will know rest for your souls. That's what he says. He says, come to me, all you who are burdened and, and heavy laden, and I will give you rest for your souls. And maybe you're here and you're, you consider yourself a Christian and you wonder, why do I, why do I constantly go back to, to idols? Why do I constantly go back to the things of this world? And if anything, we, we have more reason to, to repent this side of the cross than they did. And we, we can look at these judges and go, what a load of, the biggest idiots in the world, aren't they? They've just been saved. Do they not remember what God did for them in the Exodus? He rescued them. And then you consider in your own life and you think, but, but God's done more now. The Lord Jesus Christ has died for me now. He rose again now. So that I don't have to sin. And yet I find myself so easily going back to the things that I, I know are so enslaving. And so maybe we need to repent tonight. And ask for forgiveness of our loving, heavenly, gracious Father. And so who will we listen to? Who will we serve? Will we listen to the world and the gods that they have to offer? Or will we humbly come, recognize the great warrior king, the Lord Jesus himself, trust in him and follow him? That's the choice. If you do the latter, everlasting peace. Well, why don't you take a moment to think through some of these things and then Dean will bring us to a close. What will you do? Will you keep returning to your idols? Will you keep going back to your sin? Or will you turn to Christ? Will you return to God? Will you look and long after the old ways? Will you stray? Have you strayed? Or will you look to the cross? Father, help us, we pray. Help us to survey the wondrous cross. Help us to remember it, recall it, often. Father, we thank you that we, we have your spirit sealed, up, sealed in us. We thank you that the law is written on our hearts. We thank you that Christ is our saviour and he has conquered sin and death and taken the punishment we deserve. 
and we can freely come to you. We don't have to pay. We don't have to do any good works. We can simply hold out our hands, our empty hands, and say, Lord, help me. I want to return to you. We pray, Lord, we would do that, and Lord, we would do that every day. Father, we we pray you would help us, and uh, may all of our days be marked by this wonderful gladness that you have saved us through your warrior king who died and rose again. We pray in his name. Amen.